Recently, Chepacross won the Toronto Regional Championships using a very similar team to the Lil Regional Champion, Simone Sanvito. His team consisted of Hisuian Arcanine, Chen Pao, Rillaboom, Fluttermane, Tornadus, and Urshifu Rapid Strikes. In this call, we talk about his team, what made him run it, and what his thoughts are on the lack of regulation E Pokemon in top usage at the event. We'll also cover Hisuian Arcanine's role in the metagame since this is its fourth regional championship since the format began. Also, I recorded this when I was really sleepy, so excuse me. I've been getting much better sleep since Brian Hand started reading me stories in bed. If you enjoyed this vid, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Anyways, let's get into the call. Um, should I turn on my video or anything? Uh, do you want to turn on your video? I can add that. Uh, up to you. If you don't think it's necessary, I don't mind just being off. Uh, yeah, we probably don't need it. Alright, just so you know, chat, he is very handsome. Just so you know. <laughs> Alright. But, uh, yeah, so, welcome to the channel, Chuppa. Uh, for those of you who are not aware who Chuppa Cross is, Chuppa Cross, uh, is the fourth Chuppa Cross. Uh, he was released a few years back, um, and... Uh, he is the Toronto Regional Champion, also multiple time regional champion, I'm pretty sure. No, actually, no, you finally did no, it. What am I saying? No, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I remember you sent out a tweet. You said, I finally did it. And I was like, wait, <laughs> no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. So finally won a regional championship, but uh, you were like one of the players that the community pretty much agreed. Like, it's insane that you haven't won one yet just because of how consistent you play. Um, for series one, you were kind of the Don Dozo guy for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, like it was not up until like Portland that I played an event without Don Dozo. It was just on every single one of my teams prior to that. So all the way until Regulation C, I was a Don Dozo main. Even at the start of Regulation C, I was a Don Dozo main. Yeah, uh, and I mean, I feel like Don Dozo is just like, if you don't know what to bring to a tournament, and especially in series one where we were still figuring out what was going to be good and there was only one series one tournament it was like okay let's let's do don dozo because it's just a fundamentals based pokemon where it's like positioning and uh finding your win condition so it, it makes sense like just yeah you know maining don dozo for the entire like first half of a of a game's lifespan is definitely a smart move and your results kind of back it up yeah, it was definitely like one of those teams that like, I don't know, consistency on a team across multiple tournaments is something that, you know, you're not always going to have the luxury of like maybe a, a, a balanced play style, for instance, isn't always going to be especially in the meta. And it kind of worked out that like, oh, hey, Dantoza with like, you know, different flavors of how aggressive it is or what, support, uh, what mons are on the supporting cast was something that I could just use over and over, continue getting better with and really adapt for the meta at every uh, at any given tournament. Yeah, no, and I totally agree with all of that, but uh, we should probably talk about the Toronto Regional Championships, so uh, I do have some questions lined up, and I started screen sharing with you the uh, Victory Road page, if you want to bring that up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so uh, I guess uh, first thing we should do is we should go into the team that you actually brought. You have the Tornadus, the Fluttermane, the uh, Rillaboom, Urshifu Rapid Strike, Chen Pao, and uh, Arcanine, and... Obviously, um, this team did win the Lil Regional Championships as well uh, on Sanvi's team, uh, and I was mostly just curious: uh, did you change anything from it, or did you like just see it and you go, "No, nope, that is that's the meta call for Toronto, and I want to run that"? Or was there were there any adjustments that you made coming off of the heels of Lil? Yeah, so literally, like, the two changes, like, if you're just looking at the open team sheet, the two changes are Tornadus being Ghost instead of Steel. Yeah. I I liked Steel, but didn't think it was, like, quite as reliable as Ghost, and I was more uh, comfortable using Ghost on, like, this type of Pokemon that's a bit of a, a fake-out magnet. And then the other one is just the protecting move on Urshfu, where I meant to be Detect, but I had Protect, and uh, Protect worked out just fine. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, Rocky Helmet Tornadus, um, so obviously, you know, it was on Sanvi's team, but that winning Lil makes a lot of sense because um, what we basically learned from the first two tournaments uh, of, actually, was Lil the third or the, it was the it was the third tournament of the season, right? Yep, after two US regionals. Yeah. So what we learned from the first two was um, Urshifu is still a thing. <laughs> or for rapid strike specifically because i feel like at peoria a lot of people um it, it was it was underrepresented comparatively to like regulation e but we should have known that it was going to be good even though ogre pond water exists and ogre pond fire exists and rillaboom's got grassy glide 
So I feel like um, the team's adjusting back to from like a mental herb or covert cloak back to like Rocky Helmet on Tornadus makes a lot of sense, especially uh, with Chen Pao, you know, running around with Focus Sash and stuff and Rillaboom taking any amount of chip usually doesn't matter because, you know, it's grassy terrain, but it can help in uh, some like turn to turn matches or turn to turn interactions. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, was there anything? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, um, I guess another reason why our troop might have been lower on was because like, even if like, let's say the Ogre Pond usage ended up dying down a little bit, like let's say you're playing in Peoria, you've got that new toy syndrome. You're seeing these two like, you know, grass Ogre Pond, water Ogre Pond, your Rillaboom that now has Grassy Glide. That was probably like some of the, the highest usage the grass types have been. So I can't really blame more people for like not wanting to use Urshifu for that mm -hmm. tournament. But then again, it did like take both of the finals appearances at that tour and like kind of set the tone for like, hey, I guess Urshifu hasn't gone anywhere after all. It it really is just like the Pokemon. And it's it's a little ridiculous and didn't get like nerfed in generation nine by in any way other than the damage of surging strikes. I, I was I was certain they would nerf Unseen Fist. Uh, what, what's your stance on the Urshifu nerf uh discussion that's been going on recently? I mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Urshifu is just like such an overtuned Pokemon. It's one of those things that like Dynamax was such like um, a boomer bust mechanic, and the fact that like I think Urshifu is really interesting as a design, and the fact that it's like oh, you release this in a Dynamax format, but it's not actually a very good user of Dynamax itself. There's just much better Dynamax of users, right? So Urshifu is kind of held back in that sense. It was strong, but like generally not too overwhelming for most of the Dynamax formats. And now that we don't have Dynamax anymore, just like great, there's there the balancing lever is gone. Go there's there's no counterplay. <laughs> well, there's there's um, no true like. I, it feels like I don't know how to explain it. it my my perspective has always been like protect is such an integral mechanic of VGC that like having a Pokemon that just ignores it outright feels like the biggest counterplay to have to it is just out the window, you know. Yeah, and I think, like, really nerfing um, the move to do, like, maybe one-fourth damage through Protect would be a huge step to nerfing it, because after that, it just, like, it's a strong water and fighting type. Like, honestly, even the, the crit mechanic is probably going to hold it up, like, pretty high at that point, but it's still going to be a little bit more balanced. I don't know. It, it definitely really does need some kind of nerf, and I'm shocked that, like, you know, they went after Regieleki, they went after... Um, I don't know, just some other random Pokemon, but Urshfu water is still kicking exactly the same as it was last gen. Yeah, it feels like without touching Urshifu specifically, no matter what you throw into the game, um, unless there's Galarian, no, Galarian Weezing 2, it turns off all abilities and also has Storm Drain, like, Urshifu <laughs> will always be a thing, you know? Um, but uh, I guess speaking of Urshifu and it doing consistently well at Peoria and then onwards and every tournament after that, uh, what did you expect coming off the heels of Lil going into this tournament? Like what happened at Lil that made you choose this team over anything else? So I think part of what I, why I wanted to use this team was, I'm sure, you know, I was, I was confident people were going to be copying it. I was confident people were also going to be copying, like, let's say the um, Rinya slash Aurelian team that was able to get second. But also, like, this was the first time anybody had been using, like, the same six as Sanfi in a while. Um, originally, it was, uh, I think, Hirofumi, the Japanese player, built it in the first place. And it's like... You know, obviously the team's strong, but are Americans going to be ready to like adjust to this team within a week of it having a major tournament showing? I think they're going to try, but I don't think they're going to get all the way there. And I think that it ended up being a pretty good call that like, even if this is clearly a really strong team, that the format's not going to like exactly develop around it within just one week's time. I was yeah. also pretty confident about it's like matchup spread against other teams. I think, you know, when I'm deciding against, um, you know, maybe like two or three teams that I feel like I could bring to a regional, uh, something that's going to help me figure out which one I want to use is like, what has a relatively neutral and consistent matchup spread? And Sanfi's team like kind of ended up doing that for me, where it's just like, there were not really very many glaring matchups that were worse than like maybe 40-60 or 45-55. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, was there any particular matchup though that like going into this tournament, you looked at this team and you went, man, I really just don't want to face X or I don't want to face Y. Like, was there any one that you definitely knew you needed to dodge in Swiss? Yeah, for it was something that I wasn't, like, too jazzed about the idea of fighting. Like, I was able to beat the, I think, two for a graph that I played. But it's definitely a matchup where, like, um, 
you know, even with a lot of lapping, I don't think I've won it more than like, definitely not more than half the time. The photograph just ha feels like it can force like coin flips that don't really end up favoring the um, Tornadus or Shifu player quite as much. Yeah, but that said, it's also like still a matchup where I kind of trusted myself to have a lot of prep put into it. And then if I'm playing somebody that's like maybe a little bit weaker than me that hasn't studied the lines as much, it's not really going to be a negative matchup at that point. It's not like the lines that my opponent has to do are like completely obvious. Yeah, it just seems like a major inconvenience to your team. I was I was expecting you to say for Rigoref just by the looks of this team, you have so much priority. You have Sucker Punch, Gen Pao, you have Grassy Glide and the Rillaboom. But I think the biggest nuisances would be, you know, no taunt, no taunting the Trick Room on their end. Um, and on top of that, uh, you have a Choice Ban Arcanine and, and like that extreme speed, the Terra Normal next to Chen Pao is super powerful. But like locking into that can be like a huge risk in the face of a possibility like a, a Ferrigraph in the back or something. So I totally get that. That just seems like it'd be not unwinnable, obviously, but just so, so annoying to play. <laughs> All right. Um... So a couple more questions here. Uh, Arcanine, you know, we were just talking about Arcanine. This is the fourth regional Arcanine's one. What, what's your take on Arcanine's position in the in the meta game? Is it is he like that guy right now, or is it just more? It's such a safe pick that it just ends up finding its way onto a ton of teams. Gosh, that's a tough question. Just because, like, I don't know if I'd say Ar Arcanine is something that like stands out like super duper hard. It's not like it's secretly the number one mon in the format. Nobody knows. But I think part of it kind of just comes down to its synergy with Tornadus. Like, and this is just something that people have like kind of learned over time is it's kind of just a better partner for Tornadus in a lot of ways than Landris is, which is just really like bucking this year's old old trend of like, you know, the genies all having really good synergy with each other. And you can kind of just like, you know, pick your two favorite genies. They're going to be great balls of stats. They're going to help cover for each other's weaknesses. And it's like, no, Scarf is Landris's best set. And it doesn't actually like pair super nicely with Tornadus because Scarf Landris doesn't need extra speed. Locking into moves can be bad in Tailwind if they're not quite as spammy as Arcanine's Rock Slide. So I think it kind of comes down to like just exactly how good that synergy with Tornadus is. I'm not yeah. sure like, you know, I was also kind of surprised to see Arcanine like doing quite this well at the top. It's hard to say like what really made it do quite that well, but maybe it's, um, you know, people are too focused on beating Landris as an intimidator and forgetting about how much Arcanine can accomplish. Yeah, and, and on top of that, like Arcanine's just offensive presence isn't like something to be understated. The last two regionals were won by Choice Ban Arcanine, obviously you and, um, and Sanvi. Uh, that priority damage and the pause the matchup into just like a, a few like common Pokemon, like the Rillaboom, the grass spam that's going on right now, the Roaring Moon that's been showing up here and there obviously doesn't appreciate the uh, Rock Slide because of its comparatively lower physical defense to its special defense and also the fact that they like to terrifying i totally get why arcanine's up there but um no i think that that synergy with tornadoes you're totally right it's just such a it's just such like a intuitive pair to run on so many teams that it, it makes sense it's getting these consistent results um do you think it's carried by terra at all do you think that like once terra's gone the urshifu matchup becomes so much worse that it's like unsalvageable I think it might be like this is something that like I, I've talked with a few people who want to use like Arcanine on teams that like maybe they don't have Tornadus for speed control or my own experience with it was on like Pittsburgh team I was using something like you know maybe honestly not too similar but just like Icy um, Iron Bundle for speed control with Icy Wind instead of Tornadus and it is just not reliable enough Arcanine's defensive typing is so bad that you need like you don't need a, a bandage you need a whole cast to like patch that yeah. defensive typing up and that's what Tailwind does for it and um, a, a big fairy shaped cast yes. on it but yeah you could be using like terra on it as well but that's not something that you always want to have to commit to it and personally i wasn't really using arcanine on, on teams that can always commit that terror to it i think it's something that you need to be like very conscious of in team building some pokemon are going to be really great as terra hogs like let's say terra fairy heatran is a great one but you're kind of building around that in a different way than arcanine yeah arcanine's going to be suffering a little bit without terra yeah, no, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a scary mon to like, even even with Terra, I feel like it's scary to like, click it into an Urshifu matchup because you know that you're probably going to end up in a situation where it's like, oh, I need to Terra Fairy here or I'm going to get like KO'd by the Surging Strikes. Um, 
and just defensively rock and fire. It's weird, rock and fire is like such a bad defensive typing, but the past two generations, like the top performing Pokemon was rock and fire and carried for the carried by the generational mechanic. You know, we have Terra for the for the Arcanine, and we had Dynamax I, for I, Colossal. I forgot I'm, I'm a rock fire person now. No. Yeah, no. Welcome. Welcome. Uh Arcanine's got a lot more Riz than Colossal. Like I, I think I'm I'm willing to accept that uh that crown of thorns. No, I, I I totally agree. Look, I loved Colossal. I loved the design. I hated how that dude played. You know, like I had it on my playthrough team and then I had the Colossal. It's like, man, I want to use this Colossal. And I remember freaking Pokemon Sword and Shield. That metagame was funny as hell because we would all roll up. All the people who played Generation 7, they saw <laughs> side, side proc weakness policy. Uh, okay, idiot. And then like it kept happening. And then like three series passed. Went, oh, this is just like a real thing. Oh, <laughs> like like everything that was a joke in in Generation Seven and prior was a real thing in Generation Eight. It, it messed with me so much, and Colossal was just the face of that issue for me. But no, yeah, Arcanine, no, Arcanine totally is so much more respectable. That. Yeah, I, I spent so much of early like Gen Eight kind of struggling to figure out what was good or like you know using weakness probably on C on stuff like maybe Togekiss where it was like an okay fit but not a great one where it's like no i mean it's always been good on tyranitar but like what if you just start using it on like pokemon that can really abuse it yeah God, like I, rem was such a mess. I remember when they were running um was it max airstream fly weakness policy dragapult do you remember when that was a thing i hated uh, it uh, yeah <laughs> I, I, it just it felt so weird having pokemon speed but all right that's 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 beyond the point we're just talking about gen 8 hate now <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Arcanine, a lot more respectable than Colossal. Uh, something about this top cut that um, really surprised a lot of people. Not just the, not not just the lack of Ogre Pond, which we'll get into in a second, um, but the lack of regulation E Pokemon on half of the teams here, uh, and especially on Justin's team. That's a Reg C team. That is just a Reg C team. What what do you think's uh, going on in this generation of Pokemon where? We're seeing like teams from previous formats just be just as viable as they were in those formats as they are in like what should be a power crept metagame like this one where we have Urshifu, where we have like various ogre ponds and well we're not going to talk about the loyal three but you know like those those sorts of things what, what's your take on that so i guess i'll start off with like the easy answer which is like kind of comparing reg d and reg e and answer there is just like most of the new pokemon besides like the ogre pond forms and then ursa luna a lot of them just aren't quite as strong like let's say sinistron like the loyal three are just like slightly lower power level format compared to like the stat sticks that have good abilities so it kind of makes sense that like teams from a previous format would hold up well and also like I don't know, I, I guess we can call it like, oh, it's a team from a previous format, but there's so many of these teams that are like kind of benefiting from new moves. Like let's say Real Boom getting grassy line is a huge issue on Justin Tang's team. Like I think the Pelipper on that was running Weather Ball, which is not something that it's had up until recently. So even old teams can kind of like get these um, updates that keep them going. I think it's really interesting because like in my mind, when I'm using a team that like maybe technically could have been in a different format, like I, I did this in Australia by not using any Paradox Pokemon when they're illegal, you could oftentimes you kind of just forget that you're not using the new guys because maybe the old guys just patch all the holes that your team needs to fix. Yeah, and I mean, even on Justin's team, like, if I rolled up to a, a tournament with that in Regulation E, I I wouldn't feel uncomfortable. I mean, the Salamence feels weird, but Salamence is definitely fine. Like, you have Iron Hands, Amoongus, Golden Go, and Pelipper. Like, that's just, that's never going to be bad in Gen 9, you know? It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it will have lines into basically anything. Um... You know, that, that makes total sense. Uh, speaking of the lack of Reggie Pokemon, uh, the Ogre Pond situation we have going on. We had Ogre Pond dominate the last two tournaments, uh, specifically Ogre Pond Fire, Ogre Pond Water. Uh, this top cut, we only have two Ogre Pond reps being Jamie Boyd and Andrew Krug, and they use the two least common Ogre Pond forms. We have Ogre Pond Teal Mask for Jamie Boyd's team, and we have the uh, Ogre Pond Cornerstone Mask for Andrew Krug's team. Uh, beyond Boyd, because Boyd is Boyd, you know, he's going to pull up with whatever he feels comfortable with and he's going to make it work. Um, what do you think about the Cornerstone team that made, uh, that got uh, top eight here? 
Uh, what, what like niche do you think that cornerstone's filling on on this sort of uh, trick room team that we're seeing pop up here and there? Yeah, I got to play Andrew Car uh, Krog for like my final round of Swiss, and then right after that in top eight and going up against Overpunk Cornerstone is really interesting because it's just like it's a Pokemon with a lot of damage output, then it kind of has that follow me going at the same time. So it's like honestly, it is something of a linear Pokemon. It's not like it's going to be amazing at like swapping in and out, and you probably know what move it's going for when it's on the field. But you know, when those moves are like follow me or a 100 power, 100 accuracy rock move, it really can do a lot, even if its moves are like um, often kind of telegraphed. And I think that um, maybe that's what is part of what makes it such a good partner for Dusclops, which again, you probably know what move Dusclops is going for when it's on the field, but mm -hmm. it's kind of got like enough bulk or uh, support from something like Iron Hands that doesn't matter if you know what it's going for. It's just going to do it anyway. Yeah. No, no, uh, yeah, I think that like the Ogre Pond Cornerstone is like a super linear Pokemon. Um, in the match that you played versus him, did you find it showing up versus your team? I, I know that like Sturdy is like the main draw of Ogre Pond Cornerstone beyond the, you know, the super accurate move and the follow me versus like a Moongus under Trick Room. Um, but did you find it showing up to like a matchup versus super hyper offensive options like the Urshifu, the Chen Pao, and the Arcanine? Yeah, so Andrew, like, I think in some of his games he was using Ogre Pond to back, but the one game that he was able to take off me, he actually led it, and I was like, okay, maybe it's a little bit too obvious Ogre Pond's gonna go for Follow Me, let me try and go after Dust Collapse with, like, a Shadow Ball Flare Blitz combo to remove it instead, getting a little ahead of myself, and it's like, oh, Ogre Pond's just gonna give its life up to go for a Follow Me here, and now I'm staring at Blood Moon with four turns of Trick Room, and for a really aggressive team like mine, that's not a very pleasant situation to have to stall out, so it sort of just, like, lights out from there. So, ironically, Ogre Pond's best, like, contribution during the set was just dying turn one. Yeah. But, you know, when you're a hard Trick Room team, if a Pokemon is, like, dying turn one to achieve the right things, that is A-OK -okay with you. Oh, for sure. No, just sacrificing a piece to get, like, the Blood Moon on the field, or uh, well, I guess, yeah, his, like, only true super would be Blood Moon under Trick Room, but, um, yeah, I guess speaking of the Blood Moon, I also wanted to get into the, um, two Trick Room teams that we have in Top Cut here with, uh, Double Blood Moon. Uh, what do you think of the Mon? Do you think the Mon's gonna stick around, or, or do you think that it's somehow nudged out on Trick Room team? Because it's only gonna really work on, like, certain Trick Room options, and I've seen some Tailwind, but I don't like it on that. Um, do you think it's nudged out by the other Urshifu, or do you think that just having the special option uh, with like that huge burst damage in Blood Moon makes it a much more valuable uh, component to Trick Room teams instead of the I can't be spored, I can't be, uh, you know, reasonably intimidated uh, with like Guts Facade? Like, do you think like the other Urshifu is going to come, or, or uh, sorry, the other uh, Ursuline is going to come back, or do you think that uh, Urshifu? Uh, I can't speak. Uh, Ursuline of Blood Moon is here to stay, basically, for Trick Room teams. Yeah, that's tough to say. Like, I think one thing that's cool about regular Ursuluna compared to Blood Moon is its base damage is just a little bit higher because of how stupid, like, Facade is as a move. Um, so it kind of has the luxury of running, like, Terra Ghost as a result, and also because it uh, is often going to be running Sword Stance to boost its attack up even higher. Blood Moon is not quite the same way. It's like Hyper Voice and Earth Power to your bread and butter moves, only 90 power, it's not really that amazing. And then, obviously, like, Blood Moon as a move is really silly, but again, you might be using an item or Terra to boost that up a bit more. So it's like, it kind of feels forced to do things like running Terra Normal instead of Terra Ghost. And when you can fake out a Pokemon like that, that's a huge issue. And it just, like, gives your opponent access to a lot of counterplay against it that they might not have against, like, let's say, Classic Ursaluna, which can just be using a Terra Ghost. It's tough to say which of them I expect to, like, really stick around in the long term. Um, I guess another problem for, like, regular Ursaluna is uh, Rillaboom, Flurman, they're everywhere, so that's just going to be, like, a lot of situations where, like, neither Facade and Earthquake are necessarily going to be doing that much for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's tough to say which of them is really going to be sticking around, especially because, like, I'm not really too much of a Trick Room player. Not, not that it's, like, completely off the table, but probably, like... Not the archetype that I'm going to have to best guess as to, like, where it's headed a few months from now. Yeah. No, uh, I'm hoping it stays around. I I'm personally a big fan of uh, Ursuluna. I kept saying Urshifu because there are just too many bears in this game that are good. Like, we gotta we gotta cut it out. Okay. Dude, just... I, I, I love bears. I'm, I'm all for this, like, bear representation. I, um... 
you know, Urshifu like registers to me as a bear, but I wish I, I liked it a little bit more as a bear. Like, it you know, I, I take it back. It practically doesn't register to me as a bear. It's just like, it's, it's a, just a guy. It's like a, it's like a, if it were anything, it's a man in a dog fursuit. That's what I see it as. A really buff dude in a dog fursuit. That's like all I can see Urshifu oh, as. I'm, I'm, I'm grimacing right now, man. Yeah. You, you took it too far. No, like, you know, you know, uh, Jin Fuari? Or Jin uh -huh. Furai? Yeah. He's an MMA, he's an MMA dude. If you put him in an Urshifu costume, you got a real Urshifu right there. All right. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. I definitely, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to get you with the fursuit, man. Uh, the comments are going to be on me about that one. Okay. Taking a look at top eight broadly, and then maybe day two results. Um, what are some trends that you think uh, we should take note of going into LAIC, which is just around the corner? Yeah, trends to take note of, like, honestly, I think there are some pretty interesting Pokemon this cut that are kind of, like, making me rethink where they stand in the uh, meta right now. Like, before this tournament, I probably would not have told you that Ogre Pond Grass was, like, especially good, but after this, I'm rethinking, like, I don't know. Ogre Pond Grass does have the strongest and body aspect of all of them. Like, plus speed is just... I think Max Airstream has showed us if you can boost one stat, speed is going to be the best thing to boost. And of course, that like Terra Grass is pretty powerful, just fairly reliable coverage. So that's like definitely a mod to keep an eye on. Besides that, I think Justin Tang's Salamence is really interesting because I spent like the week before the tournament telling like uh, Gavin and the other people who built that team, like, why are you using Salamence? This thing's dog. Uh, but no, the Scarf Tailwind set is really interesting, and I think it has like something to add to like, uh, especially Golden Ghost seems like it could be a really good partner for it. Um, besides that, I'm not sure. I think like, um, obviously like Tornadus and Friends are still just really strong. Those are personally probably like my favorite team in the format. I don't know what else would stand up to them, but there is like really, I don't know. This top cut showed just that so many different things can be working right now. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, it feels like the um, the original take that people had that Regulation E would just be Reg C with like a couple of new pieces, specifically Ogre Pond. The further we get into that, I can't tell if it's true or not. It feels weird. Like I can't, I feel like we're in this weird middle space where even though we're three tournaments deep, we still don't know where things are quite going other than Tailwind Urshifu is still good and Rillaboom's still good and... Oh, yeah. Roaring Moon's a thing. Yeah, in this I don't format. mind that though. Like, <laughs> Roaring I Moon's think a thing. <laughs> near the of uh, Reg D, I really wanted a meta shake up. Like, I was kind of tired of like the top Pokemon, and now like I don't know. I guess like I'm still using a lot of those top Pokemon, but when my opponents aren't, or I also have the option to use some of those more off meta Pokemon, the decision making feels like a lot more open. Yeah, it it, it sort of reminds me of. Uh, not not quite 2018 levels of build whatever you want and it'll work, but like 2017-ish? I don't know. I Oh, I, I can definitely see that. Like 2017, like for a lot of that year, there was like a top team running around at a given point in time. But it's not like that top team was usually like totally dominating like regionals cuts. It might have like, I don't know, like fake PG or Snorlax, Celesteela, Coco and friends. Like yeah. they might take up two spots in a top eight or something. But a lot yeah. of the time there's still like some pretty rogue teams mixed in there. Mm -hmm. I, I think and I like the 2017 analogy. Yeah. And, and let's remind the, uh, the viewers, because you and I were old at this point. Um, what 2017's fake PG means because a lot of people started in 2019 or 2020. Uh, fake PG, the analogy is the least intuitive analogy of all time. Uh, if I remember, it was Vinny, Arcanine, Artana, um, an electric type, yes, Porygon, yes. <laughs> and Gigalith. E stands for yeah. any electric because it was like Togedemaru, Tapu Koko. And there was one more, I think, that we saw from time to time that is slipping in my mind. I think I saw a dude running around with a Did bike. Did people use Zerkatry on that? I think Zerkatry was a... Th no, Zerkatry only really existed on, like, screens teams. Uh, I guess Electric really did just mean, like, Coco or Toki, huh? Yeah. We could have just... If I'm forgetting an electric, I'm pretty sure it's bad and like was just not on the same level as the other two at all. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be like a Vikavolt or whatever if it was bad, you know, like... 
you could technically make it work. You can swap out that electric for that, but yeah. Um, anything you want to say before we wrap up here? We're uh, at about the we're about at the thirty minute mark. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, any other thoughts on this? God, I'm not too sure. Again, there's just like a lot of Pokemon here that I think deserve more ex exploration. Like Reggie Draco was something that I was just like had completely forgotten about before this tournament. I could only think of like one person who is using it. Uh, that's Velocity, and that's kind of because he's like spamming it. It's yeah, I, I faced that Velocity. I really liked a lot. Yeah, I, I faced Velocity a lot in some practice tournaments, and he is insanely cracked at specifically Golden Go, Reggie Draco, Tailwind stuff. I, I, I could not take a set off him for the life of me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it seems like he's really been using it for ages, and I'm sure he's, like, mastered the team by now. But it was really cool to see Rogov, like, use a slightly different take on it, where, like, you know, when you've got Rillaboom and set up Golden Go and um, Bulky Arcanine, like, this team is not all gas. It's, it's a lot of gas, but you can slow things down. You can, like, try and set up that Golden Go. And I think it just gives it a really interesting flavor that, like, let's say the original, like, Reggie Draco for Rigraph team from Japan, like, that, no, that, that team was all gas. Yeah, the Metal Coat's interesting. Like, when you have, you literally have Leftovers free here, but usually when you see, like, a setup Golden Go, you expect it to have, like, Leftovers, especially when you combo with, like, the Grassy Terrain. Um, I'd imagine that the reason, because I haven't spoken to Ragav about this team at all, I'd imagine the Metal Coat is just for a particular calc, like to pick up a KO on something while still being able to invest in the bulk. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's so it's um it's enough to one shot flutter. I'm pretty sure. That's like, what it is. Uh, if this happened to mine. Regular Golden Go is like I think even if it's like modest max, it's often going to be flutter can live. against flutter. Yeah. So by going Metal Coat, it's just like you have this turn one pressure against flutter main, and they have to respect you a lot more. Like in my case, I didn't I, I thought the golden go was going to go for something passive i didn't i lost my flutter that was yeah. tough to recover from no this is definitely big but uh yeah uh you want to let them know where they can find you on like twitter or whatever yeah i am just chapa vgc on twitter that's uh really the only place to come find me if you want to do coaching again just like reach out to me through twitter i'd be happy to set that up with you i'm always looking for new students to work with and i've like had a great track record of helping people get their their first day two finishes or helping them like look for success at locals i do it all yeah no i, I definitely reach out to chepa for uh for coaching i've only heard good things but yeah uh thank you for coming on the the stream chepa i really appreciate you uh Thank you all for watching. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube video, if you're watching the stream, stick around, whatever. Uh, but thank you all for watching. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.